uh, start the uh, discussion uh, discussion section with a uh, women discussion. She's from the uh, Rwanda. She is uh, Cecile Mukarubara. She is from the Green Village Foundation. Cecile, please. It is always a great pleasure to be part of this global and learning uh, platform. Uh, let me start by uh, agreeing and congratulating Mr. Bunta Pauli. I've just sent a, a chat. Uh, I very much agree with him that we need to move from theory to actions. This is the only way that we can change the world and we can, uh, we can sustain the development. Um, as we all know, uh, we have been seeing the world experiencing a combination of unprecedented crises, some of them very acute, uh, like the health crisis as a result of COVID-19, resulting into a big number of uh, life uh, losses in a very short time. Uh, and uh, also with no difference between developing and developed, developed countries. But some other uh, crises uh, like climate change, impact of climate change and food insecurity have been uh, exacerbated by the health crisis and are still silent killers of the majority of the poorest in developing countries. It's obvious that uh, in the countries where medical systems are under-resourced, the health crisis is compound with loss of livelihood and vulnerable communities are facing a high level of hunger. The vast majority live in rural areas and depend on agricultural production, seasonal jobs, fishing, pastoralism. When they become ill or constrained by restriction on movement or activity, they are prevented from walking the land, caring for the animals, fishing, and accessing markets. While the start of the year saw so COVID 19 sent panic across the globe. Another crisis was brimming in East Africa. From December 2019, a plague of low costs, the largest in the region had seen in generation, swept across the region from the Horn of Africa to the desert of Kenya, disseminating the crops that feed tens of millions of people. In Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, near 12 million people already found themselves in a very difficult situation as a result of extended severe droughts and back-to-back -back failed harvest, or before the horde of desert locusts descended on the crops and pastures. In Africa still, some countries uh, are still facing the Ebola uh, pandemic. Floods and uh, landsliding as a result of climate change continue to disrupt agricultural production, leading to massive migration from rural to urban. Community, as we know, community are powerless in the front of the triple trap of climate change, pandemic, and economic downturn. They are turning to family solidarity for their basic needs and to humanitarian assistance. I'm part of one organization called ACCORD, Association for Cooperation and Research and Development, that has been working with community for more than 50 years and keeps adjusting its strategy 
to different challenges and needs. In this critical period, to support community resilience and regeneration, we are working with them. We are supporting social schemes and innovative income generation activities. We are engaging with community to scale up existing systems. First set up a contingency plan consisting of increasing consisting of increasing uh, savings, post-harvest, handling, and storage. One way of stabilizing families' purchasing power and creating jobs for young people while protecting the environment is to support small-scale off-farming projects. We are also uh, working to ensure the continuity of food supply channel including between rural, per urban and urban uh, communities. Another area we are operating in is enhancing, enforcing health protection measures during this uh, uh, pandemic uh, period. We are also enhancing uh, environment protection, specifically in the area of environment protection, introducing uh, farmers to a new business model that integrates agro agroecological practices into the conventional agriculture and thus build their adaptation and the resilience. We are also building farmers' capacity to sustain appropriate measures to absorb COVID-19 shocks and to prevent future natural man-made disasters. We have so many activities, I don't want to go into details because of time. Uh, I want to come back to the community alternative for regeneration. As for community alternative for regeneration, one might consider shaping the relationship between rural and the urban communities. While helping rural community in the effect of climate change, the true battle with the phenomenon we have to be fought in urban communities. Urban areas have the largest carbon ecological footprint and enemy in, in the energy usage, which all leads back to, uh, to effect from climate change in terms of illegal and extreme weather patterns. It is also important to note that all of us in the urban community also depend on the local communities for our food system, something which cannot be understated. I think also we should acknowledge that this community have a certain traditional knowledge about using land sustainability. And that is something to, we need to tap into. Empowering local community and giving them a say and an acting role in improving their situation is very critical. The answer is in community and urban partnership. The local should have a say in how they want to address issues. Community regeneration should aim at enabling communities to ha that have suffered from economic, social, or environmental crisis to be able to build and improve the living condition in a more sustainable way. If we let people lo lose their livelihood as a result of this pandemic, once the human health crisis has eased, we will have major problems to deal with afterwards. But, however, we should recognize that communities, farmers are at a crossroads. In a conflicting situation, and the battle is more complex than one would think. Because on one side, the need to adopt environmental friendly systems 
is very critical in order to protect our mother earth for sustainable living. But on the other hand, there is a pressing need to produce more to eat and make money using chemicals. The biggest constraint we live in that it's that we live in a global capitalist world where the wish of the powerful, the richest, is the law. Thus, making poor community effort is significant in terms of making sustainable and positive change in the favor. In that, that the same vein, community efforts are not supported or embedded in a development model that put the people and the nature in the center of any development intervention. Their efforts remain isolated and insignificant to induce and sustain a long-term positive change. After experiencing a combination of crisis, communities need a strong and sustainable regeneration plan. However, this seems almost impossible as they do not have the freedom and the means to their self-determination. The only capital, which is land, has been hijacked hijacked by the capitalist regime where powerful nations have taken over communities' land to grow crops for exploitation, transforming from badly paid with no security for the future. In the development paradigm, as stated by international institution, the income of $2 a day per habit has become an indicator that people are getting lifted out of poverty. What is actually happening is that the so-called development is stripping communities out of the conventional means of subsistence livelihood and leaving them dependent on insecure jobs most of the time in conditions of safety. Therefore, community are stranded in a survival mode that gets narrow as time goes. It is clear that no community regeneration system plan can be conceptualized and implemented successfully without the adhesion approval of the powerful and capitalist nations. Sustainable community regeneration is impossible unless there is a radical shift of development paradigm led by strong global movement that led by a global movement with involvement of young people that we provide a clear framework for community regeneration. As such, community initiatives will be endorsed and supported by global policies, agreements, and programs. The current development paradigm is based and measured by financial performance that attempts to reduce all values to a financial metric. Indicators are GDP and the indices of stock market performance. People and nature are commod commodified and devalued for their contribution to generating financial returns. People as investors, consumers, and the workers. Nature as a pool of free resources and the convenient waste dump no indicators based on people living health system, well-being, and livelihood. The COVID-19 has proved this reality as even developed nations with high GDP have been hardly hit by the pandemic. 
because the development paradigm in which you operate life, nature, are just commodities to generate more financial wealth. Community regeneration can only happen within a development paradigm that puts human rights and nature in the center of the development. In this new development paradigm, life is the measure of value and the purpose of the economy and business. Maintaining, enhancing the health, vitality, resilience, and creative potential of people and nature, including strengthening relationship of caring, cooperation, and sense of attachment to nature and community of place. Economic performance is evaluated against the indicators of the health and the well-being of people living in communities. In this framework, community are shareholders in the global economy and have the capacity and the freedom to use the resources in a sustainable manner and make decisions with regard to their current and the future life. Community identity for regeneration based on self-determination that has its roots in the community's power can only take place in the context of a global development paradigm change. Because the new development paradigm frame supports social justice, community ownership, and the equitable distribution of wealth, the class distinction disappears. This gives space to rebuild social cohesion, social capital, collective values, instead of capitalism. The structures of the new paradigm system support equitable, responsible ownership participation by people who have strong roots in the place where they live and a natural interest in the health of its air, water, soil, and the other natural systems. They should be based on the following three principles. One, organizing around diverse self-governing living communities. Two, using living indicators to assess system health and performance. Three, supporting equitable community-rooted development ownership. If we put common values, common interests, and people, as well as our mother as in the center of the global and shared development, instead of money, we can be confident to achieve a better life for all. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Chow, uh, Cecile. And um, now we have uh, the second discussion, Patrick Bourne. Uh, he is professor from the University of Western Cape, uh, South Africa. He uh, research combined um, political economy and political ecology in his um, research and uh, applied works. Uh, at the same time, challenged the unjust uh, power relations and, uh, and to how to understand understand how the social, neighbor, and environmental movement demand and fight for the change. Yeah, Patrick, please. I'd like to start with that and give you a commoning example, because I think for each of the panelists, I would ask them, what is the relationship between the commoning strategies and social grievances that have led to such high levels of protest? This is the age of mass protests, according to a think tank, in fact, the number one think tank in the US, Center for Strategic and International Studies. This is why they call these places think tanks, because they're places where people are paid by the people who control the tanks. In this case, the United States military and, uh, and imperial power uh, is basically fed by CSIS. We should know what they know. And that is that there's a lot of protest 
over the past 10 years. And it really gets going in the Middle East and North Africa and starts sweeping through. And the high point you see that anti-Trump protests reflects a reawakening of the United States, which is now again underway with the uh, the Black Lives Matter and the critiques of, of uh, racism. At both. Uh, this city where I'm reporting from is the uh, most unequal city in the world. And um, sometimes it means uh, uh, even though the global north part where I live near the universities uh, is usually well fed, uh, sometimes our systems break down. We're, for example, having a full load shedding uh, experience today. All, all electricity in the country goes off in different ways. So my apologies from the South African side. I will send these slides because you might be interested in seeing the, particularly the question of how this wave of protests is now uh, picking up again with the post-COVID-19 and their predictions from another institute, various Maplecroft, a corporate consultancy of major upsurges of protests um, throughout this year. Uh, for example, in Africa, that would be Nigeria, Guinea, Ethiopia, DRC, and Zimbabwe, but also South Africa. So I wanted to show some of the slides of where the protests have been coming through, since South Africa prides itself as having uh, the world's third most militant labor movements, uh, even though they are split, but this is according to the World Economic Forum, when they do their annual global competitiveness reports, and some of the highest protests per capita. So when Sina last night says, well, where will this go? Some of the ongoing protests relate very much to food and the desperate need of people having lost incomes to gain mutual aid. So part of the commoning of food, its decommodification, is through uh, a provision of, of, uh, of mutual aid systems, food parcels, food kitchens, some of which are done through the South African food sovereignty campaign. So there's quite a nice map of that. The, the second part of this comment is to provide, and maybe, maybe if you do allow me, I'll, I'll try. I think I've got a better internet. Um, I'd like to very quickly show you in the, in the last four minutes uh, exactly what the commoning experience that comes from this sort of social unrest and social struggle looks like. So if you uh, permit me, let me very quickly try to do a share screen, which uh, perhaps will will work. Um, do you have to permit me to do this? Let's just see if it'll come up here. Um, I'm assuming that you'll see the extraordinary rise in life expectancy. And I just wanted to essentially uh, lay out for three minutes now why this reversal that you can see from 2005, where the South African life expectancy had gone down to just 52 years because of AIDS and the expensive characteristics of the medicines because they were branded under intellectual property with monopoly patents had to be broken. And that breakage is what I'd like to spend my, my last three minutes on because it's raised our life expectancy in this country for those especially who are living with uh, HIV. Uh, from 52 to 65 on average, and that's um, an extraordinary accomplishment. And it's entirely due to the percentage of Yeah. Um, um, I see I'm unstable internet again. Yes, but yes. If you uh, are getting this, um, and again, I hope it isn't inspiring. To, it's, go ahead, Dade. Yes. It's coming through. Good. Um, it just shows that <clears throat> up against Tabo Mbeki, who was an AIDS denialist, but more importantly, because the, the general structure is one that applies to all of us, that is a fiscal constraint, a fiscal crisis that allowed this man, uh, Parks Makanlana, who was the assistant, to say he would not, and the state would not provide medicines to mothers to prevent HIV from being transmitted to their infants because uh, that mother's going to die and that HIV negative child will be an orphan. The child must be brought up. Who's going to bring the child up? The state, the state, that's resources. So the first problem was fiscal crisis. The second problem was employers doing cost benefit analysis, which then prevented the 
uh, employer human uh, relations and medical units from giving the medicines to, in this case, Anglo-American, which had 160,000 employees, the largest company in Africa for many, many years. And they went through in 2001, what a cost benefit analysis meant. And it meant ultimately that only the top 12% would get the medicines because if you had to rehire the bottom 88%, you could do so less expensively than by um, firing, uh, you, you, you would fire them and rehire uh, instead of giving them medicines. So there was this extraordinary period of a structural power of corporates over their employees that then meant um, the denial of these medicines. And the third of the structural forces were, was the continuing insistence on the commodification by big pharmaceutical companies of their product. Which brings me to how a movement arose in my last one minute, led by, um, uh, it's called the Treatment Action Campaign. And uh, you know, I can go through in a, in a lot of detail, I have a little video that does this, on how this Treatment Action Campaign, inspired by a young woman, Gugu Dlamini, who was murdered because of stigmatization. And what that movement did, starting around 1998, 99, after Dlamini's death, in alliance with Medicine Sans Frontier and ACTA was to demand the decommodification and in a sense the commoning of intellectual property. And they did win at the Doha World Trade Organization Summit in 2001 an exemption, a deeper exemption for uh, medicines. Now those of you interested in whether the uh, vaccine that we need for COVID-19 can also be part and parcel of an exemption and therefore made generically will be very interested in this case because AIDS medicines, according to Vuyaseka Dabula, the head of this group treatment action campaign, were, were impossible to get due to government denialism and pharmaceutical corporate greed. The poor were sent home to die, and the, the few who could live to, to buy antiretrovirals were able to live. The size of your pocket determined whether you lived or died. And so finally, the, the last slide here is really about how over that period from 2002 to four a massive battle was waged by people living with HIV, more than 5 million, to get these medicines. And they finally won. Um, and in doing so, have raised life expectancy and showed policy advocacy prowess and commoned intellectual property, decommodified the medicine, destratified access. You can get it through the public health system, deglobalized capital, because these are made now generically in uh, South Africa, in, in Zimbabwe, and I suspect in Rwanda, Cecile can confirm. And then finally, confirm the globalization of solidarity. That's the little uh, quick uh, sense that commoning can come, um, I hope, uh, more and more frequently from the uh, social movements who, at least in this country, are very, very inspiring as sources for um, a sort of new philosophy of mutual aid of uh, decommodification, destratification, but all through the sort of social struggles that I think is the missing link between what I started with, that vast upsurge of anger and grievance about neoliberalism, corporate global globalization and authoritarianism, and then towards some preferred strategy like commoning, such as of AIDS medicines. Anyway, I'll throw that out and see if it resonates with any of your dear comrades. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Patrick. Yeah, we um, we all understand um, the uh, in internet um, facility is uh, not so good at all in uh, particularly in the global south. So uh, we actually um, and uh, the last uh, discussion will be um, um, Mat Mat Matrika and Paramita from uh, University of uh, Gajamada, uh, Indonesia. Um, Paramita is a social entrepreneur who is focusing on housing and urban development. Yeah, please. Thank you, Kinji, for having me and uh, Miss Jay for the or, uh, organizing this event. So I would like to uh, uh, share a bit about the community that is vulnerable, that I think uh, very vulnerable because they are like 9,000 people still live in uh, multi-family temporary housing. 
in Central Sulawesi. So this community uh, was devastated because uh, it was hit by the earthquake uh, on 2018, uh, 7.4 magnitude. And uh, 15 minutes after that, there is a tsunami hit around 7 until 11 meters high. And parallel to that, there is a liquefaction in four uh, massive areas. And, um, and the victim is there are 221,000 evacuated, uh, which is, has uh, 2,100 fatalities and 4,400 injuries. But then the current situation that uh, the livelihood hasn't recovered almost two years already and COVID-19 came. So uh, it was very devastated. And uh, although there is a community-led initiative uh, with an international NGO and the government did many efforts, but it cannot make a huge difference between uh, this community. And indeed, there are several things that is mentioned uh, from yesterday and uh, from this morning that uh, the organizational structure in the disaster management and uh, decision making play a great role uh, to determine the success, failure, impact, and the amount of recovery also. And uh, the last thing is the change in the civilization. Um, so from here, we saw that there is an urgent need to improve the effectiveness, how, how does this organization works. And uh, we did play uh, some dimensions uh, of recovery. So what we did is that um, uh, from building their homes, uh, they also build their human capital. So building their uh, self-spirit, passion and optimism to become the foundation for the recovery and to rebuild more safer, better, and more advanced. And uh, it's not only human capital that they build, they also build the social capital to build the self-support, cooperation, collaboration uh, with others. So, um, and uh, there is also another strategy that we learned um, after these uh, disasters is that um, their first, uh, there is uh, the health and welfare. So indeed, it's true that uh, we need to do the food security and also enhancing the role and activities of a local healthcare center and uh, utilizing the concept of healthy and disaster safe homes, community health uh, database we also have to uh, improve um, and the second related to infrastructure and environment uh, we also need to pay attention to the domestic and livestock of waste treatment uh, development of alternative energy and the availability of supportive infrastructure and the third is that the leadership and strategy um, so in this uh, re uh, recovery, we, we're trying to create a local champion to become leaders in a community a level uh, to develop the care, like what Jason uh, explained before. And uh, there is a community schooling program that run by NGO and uh, later on transferred to the community so they it, it can run independently and uh, we think that uh, there is a need for a public campaign and education for the disaster awareness periodically because um, after several years and uh, it's not only several years yeah few months after disasters um, the community is trying to get back to normal and uh, there are some uh, communities who build their house uh, is not uh, paying attention to the earthquake resistant. Um, so uh, if uh, right now we're facing uh, COVID-19, and I think I agree with uh, previous speakers that it will take a long uh, run, a long time, 
to 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 improve this. Uh, that is why we need to develop the economy and livelihood and the provision of public open space to foster the community interaction and knowledge sharing. Uh, I would like to share also related to the economy. Uh, we could also enhancing the local products and homes uh, industry so that they can keep the money and circulate within the local community which is called by uh, Michelle the circular finance. Uh, there is a example of the community that initiated uh, by us at the beginning. So we assist them to develop uh, their own platform. It's called the village market. And later on, it, it is developed become a local business database. So they use their money that they got uh, as a subsidy from the government uh, to buy uh, their needs from this platform so that uh, the subsidy will, uh, so the money, they can keep the money uh, within themselves and the, the SME within the village could uh, improve, uh, which is more, uh, cheaper, better, and faster. And uh, to say about this community-led recovery, the regeneration program should be managed and run by the community itself. But the uh, government, I think uh, they need to play a role if, the, um, if, we, if they want, if we all want, uh, to have a bigger impact from this uh, initiative from the community who make an inno innovative program to uh, upscale into a greater uh, way. And uh, building more capitals also, uh, I think it's gonna be a good uh, movement uh, in the future. And there are several other aspects that the government the government should uh, pay attention, which is the social inclusion and empowerment of the economic activity. So it's not only the community, but it's also uh, making the harmony between the government, uh, the NGO and the community. So I think uh, that's all. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, open to the floor first, yeah. Uh, any questions, suggestions or comments? This is, this is Vandana from India, and I've been listening with great interest to the speakers and the discussants. And uh, in many ways, the speakers and, discuss and discussants spoke about different regions and the need for renewal, the reinvention of localization economically, socially, and environmentally. And to different extents, they also address the bigger picture. And I'm wondering if any of them would be willing to speak a little bit about how local experiments might affect each other through networking mechanisms across regions and the world, whether we are talking about farming and food justice, or whether we are talking about medicine, um, or whether we are talking about disasters. Uh, we do have examples like the Global Tapestry of Alternatives as an inspiring collection of such local experiences and ideas. But are there ways for people involved in these local efforts to talk to each other, learn from each other, not to replicate, but to inspire unique local solutions, both within a region and beyond? I mean, I know we are kind of doing this at this meeting, but I'm, I'm talking about more kind of uh, grassroots involvement uh, of people uh, inspiring each other across the distances and cultural contexts, uh, because ultimately we want local initiatives to become powerful enough to affect and shift the mainstream. So that's my observation and question. Thank you. Okay, maybe uh, Michelle, you respond to uh, Patrick's question first, and then uh, Zhang Lao Su respond. Yeah. Okay. okay. Please, uh, Michelle. Yeah. So, so one of my observations is that. Um, you know, the people who are activists and the people who do commoning are not not very often the same people. Uh, so um, just to give an example, there's a tenfold, there was a tenfold increase in urban commoning in the last 10 years, both in the global north and the global south. We, we have a study of uh, Gov, LabGov in Italy that, that did these thousand cases. 
um, but it uh, very often the the people involved in commenting have this kind of constructive uh, mentality. So they're building, making something together, and they're very very focused on their project. And activism has different motivations. So there is. Uh, not not always a link between the two. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, like MST and, and uh, Via Campesina. I think they would qualify as movements that do both. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, there is no automatic uh, linkage between both. Um, and so what Patrick describes are more like public uh, commons in a way that actually specifically require political mobilization to achieve them while doing you know uh, shared habitat shared mobility uh, sh uh, you know like a shared uh, food system are are things that people can actually do locally without necessarily uh you know attacking the the institutional system uh, but there are some interesting examples i i'll be very quick but uh, for example i consider in many ways, the Sanders movement came out of the um, Occupy movement. And Occupy was a huge commenting experiment, you know, of, of living together on public squares. And that gave rise two, three, two years later to this kind of uh, enthusiasm for Sanders. Another example is Encomu in Spain, which, uh, you know, was actually started with a revolt against Airbnb in one specific um, uh, Barcelona neighborhood, but then got connected with uh, other social movements that were commons oriented, like the the movement for shared habitat that Ada Colauke came out from. So there you see also quite a direct link between first a wave of commoning and eventually maturing uh, to a political force. And so uh, I think that's a good thing because we, we still face the issue that most of the left doesn't see the world in terms of commoning, but in terms of market versus state. So it's it's not at all obvious to to change the minds of a you know generation of activists and politicians who've seen the world in a kind of Keynesian uh, framework. Uh, I just want to give a last example, which Jason uh, knows about, which I think is also very important, which is the Bologna regulation for the urban commons. It's not perfect, but it has been. Uh, taken over by 250 uh, Italian cities and I recently heard that one million Italians are actually engaged in these urban commons projects. And then in France we have a, a Politique des communs, which is a database uh, that was used in the municipal elections to have commons proposals ready, ready made for progressive politicians so that the commoners could then go talk with uh, progressive politicians say this is what you know what a commons solution would look like in terms of shared habitat and mobility and just then I finished Kate Rayworth uh, this is something you should know I, I you, you should look it up because I don't have the link with me but Kate Rayworth just published a fantastic database where you can put your domain like agriculture your objective and it will give you a set of um, basically policy solutions that are being used in in one or another region so that, that people can learn from each other about these kinds of uh, policy solutions. Thank you, uh, Michelle. And uh, Zhang Lao Shi. Mm. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I think um, for the lady who raised the questions whether they're um, uh, sort of uh, practice for more exchange, to enhance the mutual learning and uh, uh, solidarity. I think this has been done quite a long time, but uh, lately we just launched a program of uh, youth exchange program with Southeast Asia and China. Um, and it's very interesting for the youth from China who are going to stay in a rural community in Southeast Asia, like in the Philippines and Thailand. And they are able to, ex to experience the, the rural community life by comparing with the work or the, their practice in, the, in China. 
and uh, they could share culturally and um, also in interventions uh, or the needs like agricultural development. Uh, amazingly, this year we also used the uh, uh, internet reach the community. So bridging the community between China, Philippines and Thailand. And we discovered that there's a two similar communities in the Philippines and Thailand. They have uh, 30 years of struggling for protecting their own resources. And, and this is marvelous that uh, we will build the connections so that community level can share their experience, lessons learned in the past 30 year struggle. And this is very uh, uh, kind of empowerment and both community are excited about that. So we, we apply, of course, people to people exchange play a very important role, but now applying the digitals, we can also tr use that technology to serve the community rather than just for the, for the uh, rich or elite. But um, this is need a lot of efforts because when we set up that uh, meeting platform, uh, it needs uh, instruction, education, training for the community people to use mobile phones, to download software, how to use it, and uh, how to um, find a connection in the locality, and um, how to raise the hands uh, during the meeting, all this kind of uh, process. But it's amazing that the communities participate so excitedly. And we initially plan for one and a half hours, but exceed two and a half hours. But all the community members, the mentors are there and the people feel solidarity and connected. So I think um, with practice, uh, still a practice traditional face-to-face uh, -face or people-to-people -people exchange to share, the technology could, could really play a key role but it needs a lot of efforts to prepare, to support the community to better use this uh, technology. Yeah. So that's my, my, one of the cases I shared, which uh, I hope that um, could uh, give an example for us to further thinking how to really bring the solidarity among all the people or community, all the people from different countries. And amazingly, the cultural exchange, uh, one example is that one of the youth went to the Philippines and he learned that the communities don't have a saving culture, but Chinese farmers have a very strong saving farm uh, culture. So they discussed then the community realized, yes, we also need to consider because before we have a very rich natural resources, but now we are facing a lot of frequency of natural disasters. So we also need to prepare our, ourselves by saving food, saving different uh, kind of uh, materials. So this cross learning is very powerful for benefit of both, yeah. Thank you, Zhang Laoshi. And uh, the next uh, will be uh, Todd. I think we have serious problems here. Uh, one of the really serious problems is the class composition of the panelists and the speakers. Uh, this, this total lack of those actually belonging to the classes of importance are not present. Uh, we are talking quite a lot in terms of to them rather together with them. Uh, my experience is uh, completely different from everybody else here, ob obviously. We do have the, 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 <coughs> the urban commoners with us in the conferences we do together with the uh, small farmers in Sweden. Uh, we do have a strong um, differences in terms of <coughs> not the practice, the practical people are normally not so different, but the ideologists of, of, of the prefigurative movements are very much Anglo-American uh, people. And they come here to a transition town 
and they say, next come time, we don't want to see more projects run by volunteers, we want to see entrepreneurs. This kind of capitalist strategies we also see in this panel a bit, where you never say that you confront anyone. Everything is nice, cute, harmony, and so on. Uh, that is, of course, one way of addressing this, is talking about methods, technology, as they are social and neutral. They are not. There doesn't exist anything like social neutral. And so it is with, 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 with the whole idea of separating commoning from politics, etc. I do agree with Michel that there is a great uh, problem with the left, and that's what I addressed also from another angel. They generally want to bring the struggle back into a competition between state and market. And they don't see the, the other options, sort of. But there's equally a problem on the other side, that commoning has become a favorite tool for Davos all these discussions we're talking about by the UN, Agenda 2030, etc. And that is far more dangerous. And we have to oppose both these kind of ideologies that do not bring us together. Uh, my small farmers, who are well aware of that the commons were destroyed in the 18th century, it's not a new phenomenon whatsoever. This whole empty historic of this kind of discussions we are going on here is crazy this total lack of any kind of historic experience, that this is not a new thing at all. It has been done before, it's been done in the 19th century, it's been done in the 1970s, it's done now, but lacking the historical dimension makes it impossible to discuss. It is not possible to continue on this anti-historic way of discussing these issues. And these small farmers, when they hear about all these fantastic methods, technology that will save the world and how fantastic we can do urban farming, etc., I have to keep my telephone one meter away because they are in the reality. They know how the farms now are destroyed. They know that the general tendency is going directly in the other direction. And they don't want to hear this crap anymore that so many here speak about. So that's my answer, Vandana Singh that there is, of course, very much other processes. You have it in Via Campesina, you have it in Friends of the Earth, you have it in all international democratic movements who are struggling on this earth. And they do all of these things jointly. They address the issues of daily life, they address the issue of a local community, they also address the issue of class struggles within that local community, instead of producing false uh, things about uh, harmony in the local community. There are class struggles inside the local communities, and there's often very much struggle between the experts who organize these projects and the locals. If it's something the small farmers tell us in Sweden is they hate projects. It's a neoliberal part, global NGO regime that destroys uh, popular movements. And this is never discussed, more or less, because the kind of class composition we have here. But it's surely discussed, Mandana, if you look uh, at other places. So it's about time to be a bit frank and a time about listening to those who are actually in the realities. And I think there's, there's a good step here because of course this doesn't mean that I'm pragmatic. I'm, of course, I'm also pragmatic. We, of course, there is, is necessary to look into new possibilities of technology, about wind technology or whatever. But we do have to listen to the experiences before. Josef Huber is one example. He was anthroposophic, Marxist, and practitioner in Germany in the 1930s when they had a huge Selbsthilfe bank. It was a bank who supported projects. And so he had a lot of practical experience, and he can say things that is not said here. He said simply that their experience was simple like this. If you come as an alternative to the local market and are alone and produce your local goods and sell it, it works perfectly. If you are two, it works perfectly. And we, if you are free, the whole global market is there and it doesn't alternative anymore. If you are a perfect one inside the, the, the 
state apparatus, you come with the project, it works the first time, it works the second time, and the third time it doesn't work anymore. The whole idea of prefigurative alternative somehow spreading, somehow magically, is false. This is called development illusionism by the world system theories. And this is exactly how you destroy Eastern Europe, claiming that they somehow should lift their, uh, in their, their hair, they should rise up as if, all their, if, if one example is possible to implement in the whole world. This is bullshit. So development illusionism has to be part of global tapestry of alternatives, etc., etc. There has to be some sharper theoretical understanding before we talk about how to change this world. So uh, what is very hopeful is the reaction of the international people's democratic movements, Friends of the Earth International, Via Campesina International, World March of Women, uh, and, and uh, International Peace Bureau, and the International People's Alliance. I summarized them and I will put it in the chat uh, because they are now much more understanding the need of the local. Everybody addressed the importance of the social reality, the local social reality. So there are some interesting convergence going on, but it's certainly not going on if we start creating false dichotomies between commoning and political and economic struggle, or if we separate political and economics, or if we separate the local from the global. Friends of the Earth Sweden opposed these whole things already in 1981, saying no to think globally, act locally. We said, think globally, act globally. And now we say, think locally and globally, and act locally and globally. We opposed this whole NGO agenda in 1991, when we started the International Climate Action Day, and said, your local struggle, your local conflict, that's the key point for saving Earth, to stop deforestation and stop emissions. That was destroyed by the NGO system, and 30 years was lost. It's time to recover history and know a little bit about what movements are doing rather than creating a, a subculture of, 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 of a local alternatives separate from the global struggle. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments and also arguments and then let our forum have more debates and serious debate and also how to address the difference between different sectors. And uh, okay, the last um, uh, speaker will be um, uh, Jason Nadi. Yeah, would you respond? Well, um, yes, of course. I'd like to respond both to uh, Bandana and to <coughs> also Tord. Um, the reason I started <clears throat> and did my um, short intervention on uh, more on concepts and not ideologies, but concepts, um, rather than on practical examples, is not because uh, the the experience I have or the movements I have come from um, just the think tanks or or or. Figurative kinds of models of different economies. It's exactly the opposite. <clears throat> uh, solidarity economy and many other forms of alternatives are locally rooted practices based on community uh, building and on uh, rethinking uh, these disintermediating supply chains, uh, uh, hybridation of market and new forms. Um, recuperation of traditional forms that work, uh, depending on the context, et cetera, et cetera. What is, I think, very um, important today, and here I, I totally agree with Tord, is that we cannot separate the global and, 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 and the whole economic system as it is today, which is a, a, a one system take all from our practices and the, 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 the struggles that we do in, in each territory, in each community uh, to, to get out um, of this all uh, devour, devouring uh, system and to have a ecosystemic thought at the same time as a very concrete uh, way of autonomously addressing our solutions. But this doesn't mean that we do not communicate and exchange 
with our peers all over the world. And I think there's um, an emerging uh, cross trend movement, which is both political and civic uh, <clears throat> of, and also intergenerational um, of what we can call citizen transition, but the citizen here is a term that is very European if we want, citoyen, uh, it means people who have actively exercised their rights in a sense. So let's not look at it, at, at it with an urban perspective of city, but citizens as embodying the, uh, the active political role um, that, that I have as a, as a part of a community. And this emerges in, in, in new movements and in rethinking, re-elaborating, uh, reforming older movements, the cooperative movement, the mutualist movement, um, the, the, the peasant movement, the workers' movements. <clears throat> Today, you cannot have a, a union based on the 19th century uh, idea of, uh, of, of, uh, of work. We need to rethink unions inside and within and, and by also cooperative structures where you don't have the opposition between the worker and the owner, where everybody is owner. But at the same time, we have to also think that you are a worker and you have to defend your rights, even in a cooperative, even in a social business, even in a collective form. So there's a lot to do in, in, in this sense. And banana, yes, there are uh, places, spaces, and processes where these exchanges uh, we're trying to, to, or, uh, to, 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 to have them as much as possible. To network on one side, to have peer learning experiences, to know about the, the different examples that are working or not working in different places, to, to know about uh, campaigns and struggles and policies that have uh, had a success and an impact. Um, the example that Michel was, was saying about the Bologna um, <clears throat> regulations uh, is, 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 is an important one, but it may not work in some other place. But knowing about it and knowing how it came uh, about and, 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 and what it is bringing is very important to inspire. Um, I think Gunther's examples are, in, in this sense, are, are important, not because you can just apply them as a blueprint uh, in, any, in any place, but because they can inspire people in other places to, to, to think and adapt uh, some, some of these solutions. Some are innovative, some are not innovative, but just done maybe in a different way. We have to federate. We have to find different forms to federate, to have um, inter, translocal cooperation uh, and intersectorial cooperation. We cannot think in terms of sectors. Um, only the food sector, the, the peasant sector, the energy communities, the housing communities, etc. <clears throat> Those are important and have to continue with their networking, but we need inter forms of internetworking, like the global tapestry uh, attempt, like Repass, which is a intercontinental network of networks of networks that have their own uh, autonomous dynamics, but come together to compare, to discuss, to see if they can um, raise their voice at a higher level um, and also interact with institutions because finally we need to change those into institutions. We need to regain political power through institutions that have been um, emptied out uh, through this, this economic system. So I think um, finally that <clears throat> we're not so far, far uh, toward, um, we have spaces like the World Social Forum that need to be strongly reinvented and reorganized so that these um, um, meaningful uh, and concrete exchanges can happen. And we need all levels of representation, uh, not only intellectual, not only practitioners, uh, not only middle class, et cetera. We really need to mix um, all of this together and it, it will bring com internal conflicts, but we only can evolve through uh, these conflicts.
Thank you, Jason. And uh, I would like to ask uh, Patrick Bourne. Uh, Patrick, would you like to respond to Michelle uh, with uh, comments? Thinking about it, but I uh, suspect that the most important part uh, which uh, South Africa provides is commoning of uh, electricity and water in the urban space, which is that sort of link between mutual aid systems, including small teams of plumbers and electricians who go around and illegally reconnect. How widespread? Uh, it's 86% of Soweto um, is illegally connected. And that means there's, um, I think, the desire to get a sort of, I may even call it an eco-socialist electricity system because the activists uh, were the leaders, the Soweto Electricity Crisis Committee, are fully opposed to the coal-fired power and are demanding solar power. It's part and parcel of all, about 20 years of struggles and demands. It's an embarrassment to me to raise this, however, today, because over the last week and maybe a bit more, it's um, it's been a period in which ESCOM is uh, responding to this extraordinary uh, commoning of electricity at the municipal level by disconnecting entire swaths of working class areas. Even if you've paid but you happen to live in an area where there's a lot of illegal connections, you get disconnected. So I hope we'll be able to continue on that uh, front. And I'm certainly happy to share information. There's uh, a particular leader, Trevor Nguani, who's work, including a PhD at the University of Johannesburg a few years ago, really sets out how this commoning philosophy is coming through from a mutual aid approach, which is grounded in protest against your liberalism, um, carbon intensive uh, electricity uh, that's increasing in price and a general disgust for um, a neoliberal authoritarian state. So yes, we do have a nice example, which I didn't get around to putting on uh, PowerPoints, but I'll do that for the next one. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for all the uh, panelists, discussions, and also audience. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.